This is CyberSound, your simplified and fundamentals-focused source for all things cybersecurity, with your hosts, Jason Pufall and Stephen Maresca. Welcome to CyberSound. I'm your host, Jason Pufall, joined as always by Steve Maresca. Uh, and today we've got special guest, Associate CIO of Trinity College, Fred Cass. Hey, Fred. Hi. Hey, Fred. All right. So again, I think that we uh, have demonstrated already in the first half hour just chatting around this podcast that this this is a topic that we're both, that we're all interested in here. Uh, we're going to talk about incident response, uh, not the traditional, hey, what led to an incident, and let's talk about you know technical things. Uh, really, I think it's much more the human element of incident response, discussing how incidents impact an institution, how it impacts people, uh, how you effectively manage emotions and workloads and everything else as you as you work through an unexpected event like this. And uh, for a little context for everybody. Uh, Trinity College had an incident six months ago. Was it? Is it around there? Over a year. Oof, over a year. That's just how, how time moves. So an incident over a year ago that uh, Trinity College and Vanguard uh, worked together, and so I think we can bring some pretty unique perspectives just around just just how that felt, right? And and how communications influence an incident. How keeping people as fresh as you can in spite of you know maybe eighteen hour workdays is important. Uh, so I think, you know, Fred, we were chatting a little bit before, and, and you started spending time on the idea of business continuity and sort of managing business operations and incidents. So maybe that's a great spot to, to kind of segue into. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I guess I'll say, I, Jason, we've, we've known each other for a while, and I, I, I think one of the times we spent a lot of time together in the past was around leadership in an organization that we were both in. And I, I'm a big proponent of of thinking about leadership and where that fits into these conversations. So I guess I'll say in, in, in my case, um, I think part of business continuity is actually the, the leadership and the people side of it, right? So you, you've got to think about the servers and their uptime and, and all that kind of stuff. But in my mind, um, part of the planning process really has to do with, with the team and does the team work well together and do you understand your roles and you understand uh, how you're most effective as a high-performing team. And that's important just in general, right? But but in an instant response, um, it's really heightened. Like it's a different level of uh, of, of stress, right? So right. It's, it's, about, it's about leadership in a crisis or leadership in stress and how you kind of manage those processes. Roles change in an incident, bottom line, and people who are really the leaders of a conversation in a relaxed environment certainly may not be when under the gun, right? And that is a big challenge in these events. I care a lot about the human element in these and you know, managing that and keeping everyone calm, collected, and making decisions based on good data is effectively the, the primary challenge in my view. So how did it start? And, and by that, I mean, you, know, you had an event, you had staff that probably came into work Feel like it was a normal day. I, I always say you, know, you have to man, manage the uh, almost the excitement that surrounds these initially, right? Because there's there's a crisis, and then everybody feels like they need to get involved and they need to contribute because the institution they work for that they care about is kind of under attack, right? How do you sort of slow that down a little bit and make sure you're, you're making good decisions right out of the gate? That's a good question. Because um, I, I, it's funny, I feel like you keep asking me questions and I answer a different question. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, but that, that's normal. One of the things like I like you, about right? our relationship, we have a very like <laughs> different approach on the same or different angle on the same thought. So, um, you know, the incident response in some ways is like uh, dealing with a, you know, er everyone in the IT world has dealt with when a system is down, right? And so, so some of that is, some of that crisis management or response is, is sort of normal built into IT people, so to speak, right? right. Like, oh crap, something broke, we got to go fix it. Sure. And so I think that that response that you're talking about is sort of normal. I think we're used to when, when the, you know, in the olden days when you ran your own email, but when the email server went down or when the network melted down, right? You, you always, it, it always became an all hands on deck event. And so um, I think understanding how you come together as a team and, and how you assign roles in that process is, uh, is an important part of it. 
And I don't know, did I answer your question or I went on my own? So it's funny. <laughs> I, no, so I almost think like, well, then are you in effect doing tabletops, you know, every time something breaks? And, and I never really thought about it that way. But Well, so I, I my view on that is that that's true. However, the, the tenor of the moment is very different in an incident. There is uncertainty. You don't know where the origin is. The scale could be tiny or it could be enormous. You don't know at the outset. And wrapping your arms around that is a far bigger challenge than something reported by a user. Clearly, the email server's down. Okay, let's go figure that out. We know how to solve that problem. You know, people work best when problems are divisible and put into small boxes. Incidents are inherently the opposite. Yeah, I, I think you're you're right to an extent, right? But, you know, understanding whether the email is down because the server room is underwater or because, uh, you know, there was a, I don't know, a small bug in a software code, right? So that part of it, I think to me, is, is has a similar cadence to it, right? But the thing that really differentiates it is once you understand what's going on with the machine room in the email example, you can then react to it. What I think is different about a cybersecurity incident is there is an active adversary on the other side who is reacting to you. Right. So the it's urgency a, of the of the moment is very very different. Yeah. So in me, it, you know, so I feel like answering your question from from a moment ago, that first hour, maybe half hour, feels very similar to uh, any sort of business crisis. Yeah, the evaluation phase, and sure, but. It's it's the next phase of it because because you can't wrap your hands around it and go, all right, I understand this problem and I understand how to solve it. Now I develop a plan. Right. I mean, that's true. But but the plans have to be more adaptable and more changing and the environment becomes bigger. I think the discovery process is different, too. Right. Like I feel like it's very easy to narrow down the discovery of a technical problem, but narrowing down the discovery of an event, uh, you know, every couple hours you could learn a new piece of information right. and right. that's not going to happen. Right. And, and a potentially active adversary. Who are, you know, clearing logs, trying to hide, deliberately being uh, evasive. Yeah, it's a, it's a different environment, but the thought process is similar, I, I would agree. Except for that needing to be more adaptable, right? right? And that's, 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 I think, the key differentiating factor. Right. It, I think we were talking earlier about the, making decisions when you have poor information. Uh, that is absolutely the case in an incident. And so I, so, and conveying the, the rationale behind the decisions, right? So I think specifically to the event that we all worked together, you had the, you had the incident, you took some containment steps that arguably sort of reduced functionality at the, institu at the institution, right? And you had to be able to justify that. So then you were managing sort of communication upstream around, here's a significant change that we're going to make to hopefully reduce the negative impact from the incident, but you know, people won't be able to get on the network. People won't be able to get out of the institution. Describe the communications, you know, say up to leadership, even down to staff, to, to, to demonstrate like we're making the best decision we can with the information we have now, right? Yeah, and I think some of that, to going back to my old analogy, is 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 the same, right? I've, I'm a firm believer in that you should have a human firewall between your technical staff and your external communication. I'm a firm believer that you have to communicate externally uh, regularly, both to the both to the public, to your your sort of user base, so to speak, and to your senior management. Um, but I think what's different in a cybersecurity incident is you know you've got to involve lawyers and you've got to involve a lot more thought in that or or, or there's something different about that communication flow that right. you've got to make sure you're meeting the regulatory goals right. as well as the operational goals and the community building goals. Yeah, so, it's, it's not just, hey, give me an update on the event. It's you're, you're obligated to tell some agency something, perhaps, right, depending on what the type of data is. So, yeah, they're very different communications in that case. One example that we've encountered regularly is that people will casually throw around, we've had a breach. Uh, well... Okay, you're using a word that you know right, is associated with incidents, but that takes on a very specific meaning, especially in the legal context for notification purposes. We have to be very careful when doing our best to communicate broadly because the language matters in ways that they don't typically. 
That's true. And and it's also an odd, you know, for those of us that have been in the field a long time, I remember when people would get into pendant, pendantic arguments about hackers, crackers, and all these kind of things, and that they're different, and you have to know, and then the communications people would go in and be like, no one cares. <laughs> what they want to do is communicate out a message that humans understand. Right. Right. And so in this case, you're absolutely right, because you know you still have that communications person in the room being like, nobody understands what you're saying, and then you have the lawyer in the room saying, you really want to use these these words, um, you know, and so that's a that's an odd, difficult balance. Right. And you're trying to strike a secondary balance along the lines of saying, you know, at the moment, we don't know one way or the other whether data has been accessed, but we're doing our best to, you know, learn more about the situation. We'll let you know when we have more info. It's a, you know, we're trying to thread a very fine line um, to communicate accurately without making people more anxious than they already are, but at least letting them know that you're on top of something. Absolutely. And it is a difficult balance to thread. And I think, uh, but an important one. And that's why you have that, have to have that, the firewall between the, the human firewall between the technical people and the, and the ones that are working on that communication problem. I think what you, what you did in your event well was balancing communications with restoration because we've definitely been in scenarios where people you know opt to not to communicate at all and the excuse might be well we need every resource you know focused on that recovery right or, or restoring operations and the reality is you know, you're probably going to be out for a protracted amount of time it's critical that people understand to the degree that they you know, that you can tell them you know why it's happening kind of what the potential impact is set some expectations you know maybe being vague at the same time because you just don't know what the outcomes are going to be but you know every every event you're always balancing that sort of recovery quality with the other activities that happen in there right so you're you're forced now into a position sometimes where you're actively telling folks all right you've been at it for 18 hours you need to take a break while potentially people are saying well how fast can you get this up and you've you those are, those are at odds right Oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm waiting for Steve to comment because the third odd in there is is making sure that your environment is secure and you're following a diligent process. Right. Because uh, I've heard that from Steve a few times. And right. uh, and it is an important one. Well, it's a repeating theme. But honestly, I wasn't going to go there. I was actually thinking more about the anxiety of people beyond IT. Because you have staff with no technical role, really. You have broader constituency in general, uh, partner organizations they perceive there's an issue. It's relatively easy to see, both internally as staff and faculty, students, you name it, um, but also beyond. If email doesn't work and emails bounce, you know, it, it's pretty obvious something's going on. So electing, in some cases, in incidents we've seen not to communicate, really is a damaging act as well because it lets a bigger, darker cloud gather when arguably at least saying something. I mean, transparency is, is so important. Right. I mean, we, we advocate that in, in kind of everything that we do. And, and incident response is no different. You, there, there, there are events that people kind of want to sweep under the rug a little bit and keep quiet. But the reality is the more people know, I think typically the better received they're going to be by the community and, and you know, by your business partners and by anybody else you have to tell. It, it's definitely worthwhile. Especially um, in 2021. Uh, most organizations have experienced some sort of uh, security incident of some kind. It's It no longer has the black mark that it may have 10 or 12 years ago, and therefore PR is a bit easier to manage, in my opinion. Yeah, it, I, I, it's true. It's unfortunate, but true. I, I do think the other part of that that you were talking about that is, is interesting to me is the demand uh, for operation restoring operations versus the... Uh, ability to do that and how you set those and not even not just for the you know in my mind um your most important thing as an organization is your data and protecting your data and and uptime comes second to that right but there that's really important right. too and so balancing that both those needs uh with really the the staffing right that's a that's a very tricky balance to uh to make sure you're setting that cadence in an emergency so that you can solve the problems in uh, in a timely way. And and it, honestly, it it's uh, it's a little bit of a science and a little bit of an art, right? You know, you, you got to, in some 
in some cases you act as a field general and try to hope you're making the right choices and you have the right people in the room to give you advice and react to that. And I like the field general <clears throat> comment. You know, you made decisions in the middle of the incident to bring in other resources. And, you know, that, that potentially comes at a cost, right? Because now you have to onboard other people and you have to make sure that everybody's comfortable with the fact that you're bringing somebody in and make sure that it's a fact. Like, there's a lot of complicated decision making that happens. And again, you have to communicate to people why you're doing it and you know, making sure it actually makes sense. It, they're not they're not easy to manage. And it's not just about resting people. It's not just about sort of having those conversations, right? But you want people to be productive, which means in some cases, conveying information that people don't want to hear and yet keeping them, you know, enervated or motivated to keep working, which is, which is hard to do. So I, I think of a related subject because we're, we're dancing around the notion where uh, people are really keen to have services restored and incident response is largely about, at least at the beginning, pumping the brakes and avoiding that conversation because you're not ready to have it. Um, I think immediately about business continuity and disaster recovery planning. And frankly, those plans, just like a battle plan to extend your analogy, you know, they don't survive contact with the enemy. Every time you learn something new about an oversight or maybe over optimistic beliefs about ability to restore and managing that problem in and of itself, especially while trying to defend infrastructure is a very challenging one. Uh, I'm interested to hear some of your thoughts on that front, because I think that every organization dealing with an incident has to deal with that specific problem. Just because no plan is going to be the perfect plan doesn't mean you shouldn't have a plan, right? I think that that you know, the, the best plans have an adaptability to them. But even so, no matter what you plan for, you're how many times they say plan, but you're going to have a problem, <laughs> right? You're going to have to react to that. And so I'm going back to, to leadership. I mean, I think part of that is is knowing the strengths of your team and knowing the weaknesses and knowing how and 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 honestly, I think it's I'm going back to Jason's point, you can make a you can make a difficult call. But if you have a trusting understanding with the people that you work with, they know it's not personal and they know it's not uh, coming from a negative place. It's coming from a a need to make, I, I guess one or the other, I'm going to go a lot often. There's a decision paralysis that sometimes happens. And it's that's a difficult balance between um, not making a decision or making the right decision and when to do those. And again, you're not always going to be perfect. And so I think you've got to sort of, I'm a 90-10 person, right? You got to be close enough to thinking that this is the right way to go. But knowing that if I tried to get to 100%, you know, I'm not, it's, it's going to take too long. And I think that's a, that's sort of that battlefield operations. It's very different than the way we run our day-to-day -day businesses where you usually want to be very sure of something before you do it. Right. Absolutely. Some that often translates into compartmentalizing services in ways that don't make sense for normal operations, but allows you to bring them up in a more measured way, in a safe way that, you know, in an incident you'll scale back from afterward. But you know, it's part of that calculus. There's a very different uh, approach to the, the normal day-to-day -day operations. Uh, making those decisions are often, you know, you're, you're confronted with data that you may not have conclusive evidence about in general. At best, we're trusting tools. We're trusting uh, the defenses that have been provided and put into place, but you may never have better than 60% confidence that something is the right path uh, to pursue. Yeah, you know, it's funny, because again, I think we have a slightly different perspective on the same thing. I'm trusting people and you're tr and that people are trusting tools, right? And so, <laughs> right. <laughs> because it's well, a different perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so I think we're, we, we've got to be, you know, at or around our limit, I'd say, at, you know, at this point. Um, if there's anything I think we've conveyed today, it's incident response is hugely more complicated than do you know your systems technically and can you bring them back? And, and I would argue, frankly, managing sort of that initial response, managing the people through a pretty protracted, stressful event is really important. Developing, to your point, Fred, you know, trust ahead of time that it, it trust within the community, right? Not just, you know, say staff that reports to people in IT, but you know, people need to trust that there's an event going on. 
people are doing their best to restore things and the, in the sort of most expeditious time that they can, but that might take days and trusting the information they're getting through the process. Um, I think a lot of it does come through, you know, sort of business continuity planning, you know, maybe incident response planning, having some communications up front. Relationships are key, clearly. Uh, I really would argue these are less, they're technical exercises, but they're less technicalized technical exercises than they are management exercises and, and managing through a really difficult event. So I don't know if you guys have any last things that you want to say with that, with that sage ending. I'd say that all incidents have a bit of a long tail attached to them after business returns to normal. And that follow through is the most important concept to keep in mind, because if there aren't those final conclusions, the lessons learned, the outward communications to uh, resolve anxieties alike and provide notifications to affected parties, uh, the incident hasn't been successfully concluded. And that may take a great deal of time after the immediate event has subsided, but in my opinion, it's just as important as anything else. And I feel that you experience the same sort of long tail. And ultimately, I'm interested to know whether it felt concluded in a timely fashion for you, or if it was really protracted and frustrating. Ah, uh, that's a difficult question. Um, so I, I think it's it's true, right? I, but but I and I'm going to go back to I think you're absolutely right. So I think that there's the the initial part, there's the the full activity in it part, and then there's the long tail at the end. Um, and and I think they all have their their points of importance, right? Uh, and actually, I'm sorry, I want to cover Jason's. There's the pre planning point. So I think there's we actually, tried to end a minute ago. So we'll. we'll We'll get there. He asked me a question. <laughs> he did. He did. That's the trouble with conversations, I guess. Go ahead. Uh, so, so I think the long tail is 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 hard too, right? They're all they all parts of those have challenges. Um, and then, honestly, I'm I'm gonna the where the long tail ends and where regular good cybersecurity practice begins is a tricky balance. Like they kind of meld into each other in a way that, uh, that, that you're never really sure where, where you've reached that point. But I think that's part of the maturity of the process. That's, that's really, you have to continuously uh, have done those, those steps in order to, to be prepared. So the, in some ways the long tail never ends because it's just part of the continuous cycle of, of improvement in cybersecurity. Right, absolutely. So, so I am going to end, but I'm, but I'm going to end it this way, which is, you know, it's clear that we all have an interest in incident response. I think, you know, managing them effectively and, and just generally the space has a, has a lot to carve out in terms of how to make them effective. And, uh, you know, as always, I'd say, you know, if anybody wants to talk more about it, to, you know, feel free to reach out to us on LinkedIn at Vancourt or, you know, Twitter at Vancourt Security. Um, I'm pretty confident we can get Fred back. Uh, I Candidly, I was really looking forward to having you here because I knew it would be a, a good and easy conversation, just an enjoyable one. And I, I think we all did that. So I'm really happy about that. Uh, but I think there's a lot more here. If people are interested in it, you know, we, we could do a part two. Extended uh, release version. We could. We could. Yeah, we'll add content, right? Uh, so with that, I appreciate everybody listening, as always. Um, I hope you get some value out of this. Uh, if you do want to talk more about it, let us know, and we'll be happy to, uh, to do a redo. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Stay vigilant. Stay resilient. This has been Cyber Sound.